Hi, I'm KS Garner, and you're listening to the Solo Numbered Podcast. Today, I'll be speaking with C. Solis, the writer and creator behind the Kickstarter, a Flag to Fly six issue mini comic series. Welcome, C. Hey, how's it going? It's great oh, it's to be all, here. It's all right. Thanks for joining us here today. Um, but outside my introduction, who is C. Solis in his own words? Is it Solis or Solis? Am I pronouncing oh, it's actually Solis. Solis. Spanish. Okay. Yep. Completely. It's all wrong. good. I kind of like everybody playing around with it and doing what they want with it because I grew up listening to all types of people just say as they wanted to predominantly mexican areas like it's kind of known solis but everybody else is just their own which was fun to play with soulless it's just yeah i got no soul <laughs> <laughs> but no um for me i'm a come to comics later in life kind of creator i did punk rock and a whole bunch of uh, come up bands when i was super young and that kept me in that but um 2017 i went to go see neil gaiman speak about his north mythology book and he opened it up pretty early with writers right and that things that i want to see in fiction and i would like to create that and i had friends that went to ai and we're trying to make comic books of their own but really slow to start so finding a foothold of trying to be somewhere somebody else I could create with was a real struggle. Um, then I got into Scott Snyder's uh, Substack class, and that was a huge opener of just meeting other people so dedicated to working in comics, wanting to create comics, knowing what they wanted to create in comics. It was huge. It was beautiful. And in that, it's just built everything that I've wanted to make all the weird, crazy stories into pushing me forward and trying to get out here, talk to people about what I want to see out there. And a lot of people are responding positively. I got to talking to Lane early on, our artist in A Flag to Fly, my Kickstarter that's running right now, um, just about general feels of how the story was going to lay out and the twists and turns that will not lay into just regular storytelling mode. But through that, it, it opened a lot to people of just willing to be on this project, actually. Like Lane's huge backer of it it's great okay chris so what is a flag to fly about uh, a flag to fly is a six issue mini series uh kickstarting the first issue it's basically your typical fantasy land run by a corrupt king uh people are trying to rise up against him to fight but it's choosing the leader to focus on to lead that rebellion and it goes into what it takes to be that leader who people want to see as a leader what they expect out of those leaders and it takes you through a real turbulent time of trying to find it um i really try to blend a nice game of thrones political kind of adventure with sword in the stone fairy tale kind of stuff and it's really fun a lot of laughs because uh -huh, uh -huh. you said it because it says in the description that it's more like a soft fantasy type thing so it's not going to be so super hardcore like no you know. it's not super magical there are magical creatures around there are people that had no magic in the background but it's not going to be all about like super dragons coming to save the day <laughs> uh-huh so i read in the synopsis that you sent me that um is like inspired by hero idolization in a way like oh. why do we look towards other people to be responsible for us Instead, I guess because we're so afraid of taking responsibility for ourselves. So what inspired analyzing her hero idolization? Um, a lot came from, surprisingly, Game of Thrones when they had uh, the King of the North, Rob Stark. And it kind of seemed like he was just thrown up there to be the person because he had the name. And of course, that is all of history. You know, anybody who had the blood ties to the line were the ones promoted to be kings, the ones promoted to be lords of the land. They weren't really ever tested or like given actual leadership skills by a certain regulatory system or anything. It was just, yeah, we trust these people. And now these people's entire line forever will be the ones that lead us. And that's crazy. And just the climate that we're in now politically in America has also been that of just like we desperately want somebody to believe in while not trying to talk about our own beliefs or trying to stand up to things. It's now thankfully being spoken about very loudly. But at the time when I first came up with this, it was very hushed and everybody else was just like the loudest ones were the most crazy. <laughs> uh -huh. 
and I like that's scary. And I just want people to be able to stand up for themselves and be able to, not, if not see themselves as leaders, but be able to point out who they want to follow, you know, by being that kind of, uh, not cynical, but <laughs> like, what is that word I'm looking for? This will probably happen, but yeah. <laughs> No, no, it's fine. You'll probably come up with it later. Yeah. But um, could you elaborate a little bit more on your creative process as a whole on A Flag to Fly? Like, just walk us through the process from then to now. Because you say you started a, a while ago. A while back. Uh, so this is actually one of, like, the first stories that kind of came to me. But it had a lot of time to grow and just kept growing into something I, I wanted to make first. Um, I really like the idea that, like, Tolkien had a huge huge background to his stories and started with um language he had wanted characters to go along with his language to build these stories but the mythology of it all was grand and he started with the hobbit it's a child story for all intents and purposes but it was so basic and introduces you to the world really quick and really gets you interested into it and i wanted something that did that so the more i plotted out a flag to fly like our letterer Dave Lentz is one of the first ones that I talked to about it and he gave me character designs and they ended up, ended up looking a lot like the Venture Brothers and I loved it at the time but it just didn't it didn't sit right so I wanted it to grow and I I redesigned the main the like main co-protagonist Buck into what they are now uh, non-binary knight commander really out in front and that's grown huge in my mind and it really sets the tone for like everything else that I expect out of the world that's going to be created. But it's, it's just been this step-by-step -step. it's showing it to somebody getting the feedback and really like, it's really heartfelt feedback that I know exactly what they mean and how it became better. And through that, the last little bit came from our editor, Aubrey Lynn Jepson, who just sent me straight on the path with Lane that had all the magic in the art that brought it out for me and got me to this point where I, I it was so good. <laughs> I have to make it. And that's where I produced the first issue in hopes that to back it, I can see how far it goes, get all six of them made. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So how has it been working with your collaborators, Lane, Dave, Aubrey, Rachel, and um, Maria Teresa? So like how like how did yeah. you find them? How did you know that these were the right people to work on the project on flag? Um, with the core group, I found them mostly through the uh, Tales from the Cloakroom Volume One. I have a jacket racket is my story in that one. Um, through that, I met a tons of people. They were working. Uh, Aubrey Lynn Jepson was the editor in that anthology. Um, Lane did, I think one or two stories in that and it really focused just highlighted everybody and how much could be done within that small little group of 20 creators and just the magic they made happen there it's really highlighted what was possible through indie comics and i love that and i'm still really proud of that little thing but then mm -hmm. uh dave lentz i met through just a facebook group it was one of the first people that was like hey i'm i'm just interested in writing comics i have a script does anybody want to check it out? And he was the first people to tell me, he's like, you know, you got to watch out <laughs> for all the artists that will throw at you and they won't actually, they'll just want your money and run away. I was like, okay, yeah. cool. And that's a huge opener of just that honesty with me. So I asked him a lot of stuff and got farther along. And um, yeah, Mar Teresa was amazing artist who's now done amazing things. But at the time uh, she was working with Aubrey Lynn Jepson and doing uh plotting out a story in one of our discords and that's just really lit up her uh rachel disler i've actually it was one time they were just looking for work and i asked them for a pinup of my jacket racket character and from there that's been one of like my greatest <laughs> little friendships of twitter this that uh she's even done a whole second issue to that jacket racket story the ripley effect which i don't really have a home for but i'm probably just going to throw up on my website after everything's said and done i'm waiting for the last tears of the tales from the Vol tales of the cloakroom volume one to come out which mm -hmm. is the scott snyder signed editions to get mailed out to everybody and that'll be great and then that'll be on my website 
Um, pretty much everybody that I've come across has been just super helpful in like noticing what is the big draws of the comic and what needs just that little polish. And that's where I appreciate it. Cause I know everybody has those little things that stick out to them. Like knowing a lot of autistic or people on the spectrum. I know things just rub people weird and I can reword that. And I don't mind if it helps you just make it let flow. Mm-hmm. and stuff like that really helps so everybody that's kind of spoken up about it i always take to heart and really know it's coming from a place that wants it to see do better and in that i really trust that not having to do with corporate people or anybody that just want to sell more they actually want my story to shine better yeah, yeah. so how has it been like finally finding your people especially coming into comics so late and you know you 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 get on uh you join Scott Snyder's class and you meet all these people and all these collaborators some who've been in it for a long time some who are just starting out like you you know and then when you finally I don't know how long it took you to finally get on the Facebook and kind of just like ask the question and just put it out there into the ether like hey can I have some help and then for someone to come in and like genuinely care about you and your journey like how has that how has that been it took me probably two years of just trying to write scripts for myself and my friend to finally ask for help to bring them out into the world and then still took me probably three years past that to finally get into the classes start meeting the groups and everything else and it's a huge huge benefit to find those people and it's really kind of scary and thinking you're just going to be making zines for yourself. But I came from that background. I came from punk rock. I came from the battle to make your art. And you had to fight for your spot on the card to see if you could make your drink tab for that night. Or if not, you know, you're going to owe people money and really get into some trouble. But this is a whole other round of like some of the first things I did was Camp Nan- Nanorama. So that little group of people just coming together to be the fantasy or writers just hey you should write this amount of stuff for this month was huge just seeing all the people that were trying was huge because so many people in punk rock and all the rest of it like they're guarded they want to wait and dazzle you do Mm -hmm. stuff at the show so to see the process of writers and just like hey this is what a first draft is trash (laughs) but that's okay because i can build from that and that's made me feel better every time i was just like yeah, this this is the idea in my first draft. Can I, I get anybody to understand that? And getting it to the point of more people understanding that and then finally having it explode and become the huge universe that I know they can be. Like there are some stories that I have lined up that I'm just holding back because I know they're going to be big and long and it's going to be fun. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what do you think is the most difficult aspect um of being a creator in general um, that you've encountered that you may feel like never gets easier. Really getting in front of this camera and marketing yourself. It, it's always just awkward. You don't feel like uh, there's going to be a lot of people that want to watch you, but in that you, you grow like you get the people that like, Oh, I wouldn't have seen you. I wouldn't have known anything about this if you weren't there. And it's always just kind of like, ah, it's kind of weird just being me when I know like Lane's art is the shiner. Dave's letters is amazing. I couldn't have been here without Aubrey's edits. The variant covers are beautiful. Like it's not just me, but I need to be out here to tell people about that too. So that's kind of, yeah, <laughs> never going to get easier, but also very important. I mean, yeah, they wouldn't have had anything. Well, they we we need your your writing. We need yeah. your ideas because you know they wouldn't have had anything to draw to. They wouldn't have anything to edit or any yeah. you know to make the variant covers. We need your work. So it's just it's that just is one of the beautiful things about comics is, is the collaborations. I love that comic is nothing but collaboration on collaboration. Like, don't get me wrong; those single creators that are out there making their comics all by themselves are masters sometimes that are oh, mind-boggling but the collaboration that goes into making an amazing spider-man number 200 is mind-blowing you know those mm-hmm. people that all put their names on that gorgeous book that's now worth hundreds if not thousands of dollars you know that kind of stuff is just i love that i love that just coming from a band aspect of wanting people to all work together and make this giant sound it's like this is this is also something like that yeah 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 So what's something you've learned along the way that you wish someone would have told you when you first started? 
I didn't need to wait to start. I could have been writing. I could have been even doodling just something that got me into a convention to talk to somebody that would have been like, oh, you want to do this? You could do this. You definitely can. Like that has been the doors that I've opened everywhere. I We've been doing this by accident too. Come on, let's go. It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. I love that. I just wish I could have done it earlier. <laughs> yeah, I try to think of when I'm procrastinating or I feel like um, something is not ready to be done is that, you know, uh, four months from now is going to be four months from now regardless. So are you going to be four months are you going to have any type of progress in four months or are you just not going to have anything done in four months? Because it's all going to be the same regardless. You're going to be the same age four <laughs> years from now, regardless of what you do. Yeah. It's, did you build it? Did you push it yeah. out there? I love completing stories. I love completing projects. That's another good just testament of pushing forward, making things presentable and done. And I, I'm happy to start it with this one, <laughs> mm-hmm. at least by myself, because like I said, I've already been in that volume one of tales of the cloak room and i also have a story in volume two so outside of working on a flag to fly how well do you find balance for your life and how do you typically manage your mental well-being when you become stressed frustrated or overwhelmed um so i my day job is uh music per, not music production uh technically uh, music festival production. I do heavy machinery uh, delegations for music festivals, like uh, people that are building the stages and stuff at those. And that usually takes me away from anywhere from two to six weeks at a time, but then also gives me two to three weeks in between shows that I have nothing to do where I come back and I'm able to reset myself. And that's where I find myself with a lot of time to kill where I I've always kind of been a hard worker or somebody who wants to pass time accomplishing things and getting stuff done. And as much as I want to sit around and play guitar all the time, it just turned into something more and I started writing more and yeah, that it's not easy doing that because it's always just constantly a grind at something. But at the same time, without those things to distract me, I sit around and get into all types of debauchery and bad things for my health. And it just, it went really bad. Uh, punk rock, has its tolls that it wants you to to sell and nah it's it's mm-hmm. not worth it it's not worth your life it's not it's fun don't get me wrong you should experience some things in your life but nothing to get stuck on nothing to die for uh-huh. Uh-huh. the soul of punk rock is always experimentation and sticking up for the little guy that i will die for but uh we're better than everybody and you need to bow down in front of us kind of feel that a lot of the stuff turned into is not nah yeah yeah i mean so is there anything else that you wanted to touch on about uh, a flag to fly the kickstarter that um we may have missed as a whole maybe discuss rewards for potential backers um yeah if i can the first week which ends on Feb- no, sorry april 8th is a, a nice bundle that has highlighted number one issues from our other i think i got a mower going in the background you want to uh, should i well, I don't hear it. So. Oh, okay. Sweet. Sweet. Okay. Um, yeah, I have a, a bundle in the first week that ends on April 8th with a highlighting a bunch of number ones from other creators. They were so generous to donate. Uh, we have Playing Swords by Gorilla Press Comics. I have uh, Magic Powder. Where did I have that? Dude? I have the names of everybody where I do this. And I think it's art artificial. Yeah, artificial number one, but I was gonna do Jeff Schiller. Uh no. But yeah, I guess I can do that instead. Just um <laughs> playing swords number one by Girl Press Comics, Magic Powder, and Artificial Number One coming in a four pack of digital comics. That one's really good. And along with discounts, we'll all be ending on, like I said, April 8th. Okay. Um, I'm just looking at the Kickstarter too. Oh, no problems. Yeah. And then you have, it looks like, I guess the variant covers for one of the tiers, t- uh, C, C flag. Yep. That one's going to be the Mar Teresa Suska cover with uh, Leon on the cover looking quite beat up. It's really beautiful. I really love her style. 
just kind of adds this this fantasy kind of feel to all of it. And then there's the cover B, which was by Rachel Disler, also um, yeah, amazing cover. And then, of course, there's the cover A, which is done by the interior artist Lane Lloyd Bach carrying the nice group that will be following along. It's good. Amazing artists. Uh, I think, uh, what else? You get your name in the credits. Um, there's a sticker set that you get, too. We have mm -hmm. sticker sets. We have uh, prints of our covers, all of those beautiful covers. Um, Definitely every tier that we have, even if it's just donate a dollar, you can get your name into the back of supporters and people that want to see this comic book grow. We appreciate every little bit. Um, we also have a LCS tier, or a, a retailer tier, if any of the retailers out there would like to back it with uh, 10 copies of the A cover, two copies and one signed copy. Right. And then I think the last two, or you get your likeness as a character in there, and then um, Aubrey will edit um, something for you, a comic book editing session with Aubrey. Those no are... A yeah, no AI, and no not safe for work. Yeah, those are the grand tiers that we have there. Uh, of course, everybody likes to see themselves in the comic book world. We love that too. So we like to offer either episode two or three you get your picture in it we'll give you choices of which character you're portrayed as so nobody gets thrown in to be the bad guy every time we don't like that <laughs> and then yeah we love indie creators since i came up with the group so late in my life technically it was really the group that brought us all together that helped me focus myself so i figure if somebody needs editing aubrey is the perfect person to talk to and really awesome be beautiful if they got their chance yeah so see is there anything else that you wanted to touch on are you um doing any other projects i know you're in um tales from the cloakroom volume two um and is there any other work that you're doing are you going to be in any conventions or um right now i'm gearing up for festival season season in uh music land so oh, i'll yeah. be heading out to edc las vegas and a couple of those things but um right now i have uh Volume two coming out, which I believe launches in May, and then this finishing up in May. Mm -hmm. Then I have the other uh, small six page episode of uh, the Ripley effect with Rachel, Rachel Disler coming for my website. So I have a nice little domino effect of things to drop. I still have a lot of things to produce. Um, I actually have some, I'm in the tier of uh, Scott Snyder's uh, Substack where I get to basically pitch him stuff. And he gives me feedback. So I actually have the rest of this lined up for my next one-on-one uh, -on -one visit with him. See if there's anything he wants to add to my, or just something to say. I don't really get anything to add from <laughs> that tall of order. He doesn't want to be sued for anything. But yeah, he does real, real great feedback, a little real great stuff on marketing. So I'll be happy to see what he says about the rest of this. And I think that should do it. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, again, I want to thank C. Solis, the writer and creator behind the Kickstarter of Flag the Fly six issue mini, mini comic series uh, for joining us here today. All of his socials and website will be listed in this episode's details alongside a Flag the Fly's Kickstarter link for those who are interested in supporting the comic that is now currently available until May 1st. Again, I'm K.S. Garner, and you've been listening to the Solo Network podcast. Thank you. Thank you.